I'll, um, I'll begin by uh, welcome everyone to the session. Um, thank you very much for coming along. My name's Sue Yendel. I'm the director of the um, of CIRCLE, the Centre for International Research on Care, Labour and Equalities, which is a research centre of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Sheffield. And um, I'm also the principal investigator of the new ESRC Centre for Care. And it's a great pleasure to introduce a relatively new member of staff at the University of Sheffield, um, who joined the management school at uh, at Sheffield, I think, um, it, uh, just under a year ago now, um, Dr. Christian Morgner. And Christian has uh, previously worked at the University of Leicester in the UK, but he's also held a postdoctoral research fellowship um, in Japan at Hitotsubashi University, um, which he might um, be happy to answer any questions about what he was doing there, which sounds very interesting. And he's also held positions at Yale and at several European universities, including at Sciences Po in Paris. So we're very pleased to have you with us. Christian is going to talk to us today about research he's been doing um, under the title, An Alternative Experimental Approach to Understanding Pain in People with Dementia. So welcome to, um, to the session and I'll hand over to you, Christian, to address your subject. Thank you so much, Sue. Thanks also so much you know, for the opportunity to present my research and so, you know, some of the uh, research I've been doing in this area. So as Sue's mentioned, I'll be presenting today a short piece that I've recently completed. It's an uh, AAUK funded project where we completed the um, empirical research just before the pandemic in early 2020. So I still remember at one of the last workshops where we were dis discussing already the developments in China. And then three weeks later, uh, the UK was also under lockdown. So in this research project, um, I was working with uh, people with dementia, carers, professionals, psychologists, in order to develop a new understanding um, of pain sort of in, in people with dementia, but likewise, we also wanted to develop new types of accessible research methodologies. And all of that research, in a sense, is the outcome of um, a number of previously funded research projects um, in that field, you know, broadly around arts interventions. And while sort of, you know, I was working on these projects, the, the notion of pain or the topic of pain was frequently mentioned, um, as well as um, people with dementia, their carers, and um, also professional care staff. And so, you know, while I had these conversations, there was always, so, you know, this ambiguity in a sense around it. What is it? So, you know, is it different? How is it being treated? How to deal with this and so forth? And so, you know, really, so, you know, people are mentioning quite a number of um, obstacles. And in a sense, you know, out of these projects and discussions, this project very much emerged where we wanted to develop a kind of first approach into this, um, into this direction. So just so you know, to give you a bit of context, uh, for those of you, so if you know, who don't know much about it, um, so dementia, um, there are about 50 million people in the world with dementia, and these numbers are um, rising quite steeply. So they're expected to be double within the next 20 years. Uh, so for instance, in the UK, they're at the moment, just under about a million people with dementia, and uh, this number is going to rise uh, to about 2 million by 2050. Also, so if you know, people that have dementia, um, it's very you know, frequent for them to experience pain, to, uh, to experience continuous pain, physical as well as mental. Uh, so it's a very sort of, you know, common appearance, in particular sort of, you know, with this kind of illness, that pain is um, quite a frequent part um, uh, of their daily life. So when we talk about pain, actually, what does it mean? Sort of, you know, how do we sort of, you know, usually understand it? And what we did in this research was we looked at quite a number of different um, definitions. I think, you know, in the end, we looked about at 50 different medical definitions. But I think the one formulated by the International Association of Pain really sort of, you know, broadly summarizes most of the conceptual understanding that is currently out there. And here, um, pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with an actual or potential tissue damage. And I think, so, if, you know, what you can, what we sort of, um, 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 draw sort of, you know, from this definition is that on the one hand, it's very much defined in most of these definitions that pain is always something that is unpleasant or negative. But then also on the other hand, it seems that most of these definitions have an understanding as, of pain as being something quite objective, rather right? as like an, I don't know, injury sort of, you know, to your skin or an injury to the body. And that sort of, you know, particular experience is something that kind of, you know, objectively tells it in a sense, what is the pain that this particular person is feeling? 
And this then, so if you know, then in turn would lead us to the question, well, if it is so quite objective as some of these you know, definitions uh, seem to suggest, what are the kind of um, measurements or tools that are there in order so if you know, to detect it? I mean, is there some sort of procedure where you can measure the, um, you know, so if you know, neurological stream, let's say, or the electrical signals in this one, and then say that person is a seven. So if you know, are there kind of, you know, these measurements? And it's actually quite interesting when we looked into this, that there is no clinical procedure to measure pain in such an objective way. So the only sort of, you know, measurements that are currently out there are these two. They are so-called pain scales and pain questionnaires. So when you sort of, and I don't know if you've ever sort of, you know, had experienced one of those, just to give you a bit of context on these, so pain questionnaires, they tend to be relatively elaborate sort of, you know, questionnaires, as it says, where you know, patients sort of, you know, have to give ratings across a number of different words, so you know, pains in needles, burning, and so forth. And they can be really, really extensive. So in the UK, the standard pain questionnaire is about 90 keywords that you have to mark. But I've seen sort of, you know, pain questionnaires in other languages, in Dutch and in Arab, where they can be 150 or up to 200 words long. And so, if you know, then you kind of always, you know, use that procedure in a sense that, you know, people have to rate, to rate, you know, across these different keywords and how they feel about those. The problem is, sort of, you know, when you start to look in the research, that there's a lot of evidence that these pain scares or pain questionnaires have proven to be quite unreliable. Um, so they have proven to be quite unreliable, in particular, so if you know, for those people who have, uh, have quite a continuous experience of pain, because it is actually very difficult, um, so if you know what the research is suggesting, when you have to, a subjective experience to rate it so if you know, across several days. So maybe today, so if you, know, you rate your experience as a seven, but we've seen that you know, maybe you, uh, on the next day, it will be very difficult to compare that and um, see so if you know, on the next day, it is also a seven. So there's a lot of, so if you know, evidence that is suggesting that these pain scales, so if you know, you know, they hint and suggest that they're quite an objective measurement, but they're actually really relying on a highly subjective experience, and so if you know, are therefore giving sort of you know potentially away an um, objective impression that so if you know, isn't the case with them. However, I think what all these sort of you know questionnaires, pain scales, and so forth, I think suggesting is that in order for pain to exist, it needs to be communicated. So, so if the person, in a sense, needs to express themselves sort of you know someone needs to tell i'm in pain right so if you know someone needs to non-verbally or verbally sort of you know make that state of feeling clear to another person so this is sort of you know one particular element but also you know it requires that the person on the other end is sort of you know competent and able to interpret this kind of you know communication so therefore what we can actually see as in what sensing is that pain requires quite a complex uh, communicative interaction in which both of these participants establish and, in a sense, create and understand the notion of pain uh, that this uh, particular person is experiencing. This sort of, you know, complex communication situation is becoming quite a um, sort of, you know, difficult situation for people with dementia because as part of the illness, in case you don't know, in particular, so if you know, the linguistic capabilities are one of those that are actually quite early on in a decline. And when I say uh, linguistic capabilities are in a decline, it goes both ways. So it is on the one hand that people with dementia are less able to express themselves, you know, initially as if, you know, certain words, so if, you know, start to disappear, and then so if, you know, it can take over and so if, you know, really affect uh, the overall ability. But also, likewise, it goes the other way that people with dementia are, are so if, you know, less and less, so if, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult for them also to understand what other people are saying. And in a sense, if, you know, um, understanding the meaning of what other people are, um, are telling them. So in a sense, this whole sort of, you know, mutuality that we find in these interactions, which is really important for diagnosing pain, is severely limited in people with dementia. And what we then see is sort of, you know, two quite negative outcomes. So on the one hand, we see that pain is underestimated. So it's underestimated because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, people with dementia might appear to have quite an erratic behavior, it could be loud, it could be interpreted as aggression. And often sort of, you know, this is then labeled, oh, you know, this is a person with dementia, right? So, if, you know, kind of fitting that particular behavior. And therefore, the problem is we are not really able to see that the, pater the, the state or the experience in which they're in is actually related to that experience of pain. And that's if, you know, then underestimates the kind of, you know, uh, state of pain that they're in, leading then on their end to, you know, enhancing the anxiety about that state, further aggression and further oppression, which obviously is accelerating the development of dementia. 
And likewise, what we also see is, you know, again, you know, in relation to that behavior and the uh, non ability to sort of, you know, properly assess it and diagnose it, we see that sometimes then pain is also overestimated. So I don't know if you had this experience, you go to a care home and then sometimes you see a person with dementia in a wheelchair. And here what happened is, is if, you know, we assume sort of, you know, there is a very severe state of pain in which this person is in and they've been given far too much pain medication and they're almost being sedated sort of, you know, by that kind of, you know, misdiagnosis. So you see, sort of, you know, therefore, properly, you know, diagnosing pain is quite an important thing, sort of, you know, in this particular field because it can have quite severe impact you know, on the well-being and on the lives of people with dementia and obviously, sort of, you know, also their carers and the people looking after them. So therefore, in this project, we, we try to address two particular research questions. So first and foremost, we wanted to understand and sort of, you know, overcome the current limiting, um, the limits in the current clinical definitions, like I said, you know, which suggest a very objective understanding, but seem sort of you know, not to be able to incorporate that more communicative understanding, which is really important for um, diagnosing pain. And then secondly, in order sort of, you know, to facilitate that understanding, we also, as also like a personal research projective of mine to develop more accessible research methodologies through sort of, you know, which we could gain that better understanding in people with dementia. So quite sort of, you know, um, basically you could say in order to address that, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a participatory research project with people with dementia to gather, you know, to them as co-researchers to develop this new understanding of pain. And I think obviously, you know, this topic around participatory research and also, you know, accessible research methodologies is sort of, you know, quite, you know, an, an important um, development. And I think, sort of, you know, a lot of people will agree that this is a very important approach. But then we also know that it comes sort of, you know, with a lot of challenges. If we really sort of, you know, want to make this particip participatory research quite meaningful. And when you look at the literature, uh, there are quite a number of obstacles that are being identified, so, you know, kind of preventing us from developing accessible research methodologies where we can, um, you know, benefit from a participation, participation. So, you know, where really, so, you know, everybody can contribute, let's say, in an equal way, in a creative way, and so, you know, provide their expertise and knowledge. So one of these elements is an obstacle is the uneven distribution of knowledge. And typically, so if you know, with the uneven distribution of knowledge, this refers in the literature to the division between the experts and those what we consider lay people. And the impact sort of, you know, of this one then in participatory research is often that the experts tend to be the ones that speak most. Right. These tend to be the people that you know, dominate these discussions that then in the end, so if you know, define these categories and then define sort of, you know, the meanings and so forth. And those sort of, you know, who consider them maybe as lay people or put into this position of being lay, uh, lay people have then less of an ability to, you know, contribute and influence, you know, these understandings. So these are sort of, you know, one of the challenges that we see in here. Also, likewise, we see that there are variations in verbal communication and debating skills. So let's say, you know, someone who's coming more from an academic context, you know, we are potentially quite used to, you know, to these discussions and debating, you know, every day sort of, you know, in, a, in an education environment with students and so forth. So again, sort of, you know, what we see is here, there's quite an unequal distribution of these skills. So someone obviously, you know, who is much more capable uh, to, you know, formulate their thinking, formulate it in a clearer way, potentially, so, if, you know, follow, so, if, you know, complex, so, if, you know, discussions and so forth. Again, sort of, you know, will be at an advantage in such a participatory model and therefore, sort of, you know, might then, so, if, you know, lead to the exclusion of those who are, so, if, you know, less able so, in terms of their communication skills. And then finally, what we also sometimes see is that although, sort of, you know, we would like to have a creative participation. Sometimes, you know, the atmosphere in which these events take place, it can be sort of, you know, very sort of, you know, office -y situation. It's maybe sort of, you know, not welcoming enough or if it's taking place in a care home or in a hospital, might sort of, you know, also have certain, you know, pre-stigmatizing atmosphere in terms of, again, you know, dividing those people in the room. In order, sort of, you know, to overcome these, um, these obstacles, we sort of, you know, try to come up um, with an experimental theoretical workshop Format. And when I say sort of, you know, workshop, um, we actually really used, as you can see here, sort of, you know, in the, in the text, this idea of workshopping. So let's say a traditional academic workshop is potentially more a format 
let's say, which is maybe more like a mini conference where you have several speakers and they present a paper. But the idea of workshopping is something that I've come across in some of my previous research where we worked with people who coming, came from the performing arts. And it's also a format that exists, and actually like a research format that exists in the performing arts. And workshopping here means is that people really sort of, you know, try to test out new ideas. There's an emphasis on, you know, you, you improvise and so forth. So there's this kind of general openness, but it's not just like a kind of like a sense of tabula rasa discussion, but it also has this idea that you want to try to nail it down. So it's a combination between focus in a sense, group discussions, but very much with a focus on testing and developing new ideas. So therefore sort of, you know, as a kind of broader framing, we use this idea of a, of a workshopping coming from the uh, performing arts to address, to address sort of, you know, this element that we wanted to have quite a creative and open atmosphere. What we also did was the participants were not grouped as authorities, let's say academics and professionals versus others. So sometimes what you also see with these workshop settings is that on the one hand, you know, on certain tables in the room, you position the experts, be the academics, be the clinicians. And then on the other hand, you present the audience, let's say the people with dementia or their carers and so forth. So again, as you can see from the picture, we really sort of, you know, try to avoid that. And it was all arranged in a circle and there was no, in a sense, designated structure that someone is an authority, that someone is being a main speaker, or that someone sort of, you know, is sort of, you know, not in that particular role. So again, sort of, you know, due to the internal arrangement, we try to avoid sort of, you know, this particular kind of um, pre-grouping. And then finally, as you can also see here, sort of, you know, from this picture, I really sort of, you know, wanted to make great effort with this one to create a space that is a is a safe space, but is also a space that is creative um, so the, the picture I've have here is actually I don't know so if you know if you're into cricket so this is the um, Trent Cricket Stadium here in Nottingham and we particularly just you know used um, their facilities for this one and we used it for several reasons so the first reason is that the cricket stadium is actually in a in an excellent sort of you know commuting distance from the train station here in Nottingham you can actually walk from there so it's very accessible it has its own um, parking facilities and it's very well connected with public transport. So again, you know, thinking about people with dementia and their cares, it was also highly accessible. I've also sort of, you know, opted for this one because um, in one of their function rooms, uh, there is a dementia group that is meeting also on a monthly basis, which means staff, in particular the wardens, you know, who work at the stadium had already received some dementia training. So therefore, you know, the people that would already, you know, work there in these sort of, you know, supportive positions, sort of, you know, would be able also to facilitate such an event. There was, you know, good access to toilets. It was, you know, wheelchair accessible and all of that. So really sort of, you know, in a sense, also looking at these kind of, uh, infrastructure you know, as being as welcoming and accommodating as possible. And then finally, also you know, using, I think, the idea of sport was something that was quite important to me because we often say, so, you know, sport has this quality. It can you know, transcend, you know, it can bring people, bring people together in a sense who come sort of, you know, from a variety of different backgrounds. And I kind of you know, wanted to tap a little bit in this atmosphere because, like I said, you know, we really wanted to create a participation across sort of, you know, where everybody feels welcome and then in the end obviously also everybody sort of you know, in there would get a name tag not just you know the academics and so forth but really sort of you know, everybody was seen as a meaningful contributor why we sort of you know made all these arrangements in terms of the overall structure in terms of the infrastructure and so forth there is in particular one other element that i've often seen sort of you know when it comes to participatory research and it's also mentioned in the research that and again sort of you know can be quite an obstacle and that is more due to the internal structure of how we run the overall discussion. And what you often see is these discussions, they can be quite fast paced, right? You might have experienced this as an academic yourself, you know, you're in a discussion or in a panel discussion. And often what happens is, you know, you've been given a certain question and why sort of, you know, this certain question is given to you. What you start sort of, you know, to do is you start sort of, you know, thinking in your head, how can I respond to this question? And while you sort of, you know, start thinking, other people start already talking and responding to that question, right? And while you're still thinking, it means you can't really listen to what the other person is saying because, you know, you're still formulating your question. And it might have, you know, even then come to this situation where you're thinking about the potential answer, but the answer has already been voiced by a person right next to you. So again, you know, you start thinking, what else could I say? And again, so if you know, you're not participating properly in what other people are saying. And as we see stuff, you know, if that's the case, right, what we actually create is more a 
a kind of, you know, a monologue of many speakers, so to say, but we are not really creating a dialogue where people are able to respond to each other. And we really sort of, you know, wanted to create a scenario uh, where people can respond to each other, kind of, you know, dialogical structure where arguments build on each other, you know, where we can increase in complexity because we really sort of, you know, wanted to deal with quite a complex subject and really sort of, you know, therefore create a scenario for, uh, for mutual learning. So in order sort of, you know, to come up sort of, you know, with a discussion that is able sort of, you know, to create this dialogue in mutual learning, I sort of, you know, imported again, two other features. So this first feature is coming from an approach that was um, uh, developed about 20 years ago in arts education programs at MoMA in New York. And it's now sort of, you know, one of, I think, you know, the most dominating arts education um, delivery as you find in Northern America. It's still sort of, you know, relatively unknown um, in the UK or in Western Europe. And it's called visual thinking strategies. Also, you know, what the, 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 you know, the people at MoMA sort of, you know, discovered 20 years ago was that a kind of similar phenomenon that I explained, you know, you ask people in the audience, what do you think about a work of art? And then later on, they realized, although people enjoyed the talk, they didn't really, weren't really able you know, to learn about this. And again, so, you know, it, it was, you know, due to this element, as I've just explained, because you couldn't really listen to, so, you know, what other people were saying and that kind of, you know, dialogue couldn't really be built. And therefore, you know, they introduced a tool, and I think it's really useful to, I can really only recommend it, which is called paraphrasing. And the idea behind paraphrasing is that you have a discussion and one person in that discussion is saying something. And then, so, you know, once this person has finished their statement, there will be a facilitator in the room, right? A facilitator. So not like an authority, just a facilitator. And that facilitator will give like a very brief factual summary of what this person has been saying. And what this does, you know, to the overall communication is it kind of slows down the whole communication. So you're not anymore, you know, in this anxious state that, oh, no, I need to have like an answer ready because I might be the next person. You can actually be totally relaxed because whatever has been saying will be repeated and you can really properly, properly listen to what other people have been saying um, in, that, in that very discussion. So that was one element to, so, you know, deal so, you know, with, the, uh, with the pace. And the second element is that we also you know, use this idea of a, it's called the two-step flow of communication. So it's a communication model uh, that was developed in communication studies. And the idea sort of, you know, here is a bit that um, we give an ability to learn sort of, you know, from a communication experience. So it's not a kind of, you're directly involved, but first sort of, you know, you can almost, you know, see and visit a, a, a communication situation and therefore sort of, you know, adapt to this. So what does it mean sort of in an hour context? So what we actually did was in the workshop, when you've also you know, seen the pictures early on, we arranged the, the people sort of, you know, in two groups. So initially we had a group, what you might say in the inner circle, which was a very diverse group. So we really sort of, you know, made sure that the participants coming from, um, you, know, sort of, you know, diverse parts of the population in terms of their gender, in terms of their age, in terms of their professional background, in terms of their ethnicity and so forth. And we created like a small diverse sample of those sort of, you know, who felt sort of, you know, we are potentially, you know, uh, more capable in a sense, you know, to be put into this situation, have this, you know, relatively, you know, open, creative uh, situation in here. So this is in a sense where we started. And around them sort of, you know, we grouped those who, who said, sort of, you know, first we would like to, you know, get comfortable, sort of, you know, get accustomed, sort of, you know, to that particular situation. So that was in a sense um, this kind of, you know, direct scenario. And then from there, what you can see is then those people who were then in the inner circle, where we used this paraphrasing structure, where then in the second phase of the project moved sort of, you know, then into these smaller groups. And there then sort of, you know, we repeated exactly the same element uh, that we had in the in the previous round, but now everybody being very comfortable, you know, having experienced the flow of communication, the direct one in the first group, and now sort of, you know, being in that second stage, and therefore sort of, you know, being comfortable having um, adapted to this. Okay. So this is in a sense of, you know, kind of trying to summarizing what the workshop process looked like. So we first had the preparation phase. So you see sort of, you know, a lot of thinking in terms of, you know, obstacles to that kind of participatory research, conceptual definitions and so forth went into also in the sense how we, um, you know, selected the number of contributors and participants. So in the end, there was about 30 people who participated in there. And we divided the overall structure 
of these sessions into two phases. So first we had the phase, as I've said, where we started off with this discussion more in this diverse inner circle and so, you know, people could adapt and learn from this. And in the second phase, we sort of, you know, would then move sort of, you know, to a variety of different smaller tables. And here we divided this into two different stages. First, we asked people, um, um, so, you know, what is their understanding of pain? And then in the second round within phase two, we asked them what kind of obstacles do they come across uh, when they deal with people with dementia or pain? Uh, we also you know, provided quite a number of really creative tools. So we had post-it notes, we had large scale sort of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, paper sheets on the, on the tables where people could draw on, make pictures and so forth. And all of that then sort of, you know, was later on collected. It was being visualized in the room. Also, you know, having these visual tools, you know, people could walk around and see sort of, you know, what other people had written on these post-it notes. So again, so sort of, you know, creating as much dialogue, creative stimulation and so forth, as much as we could in order so, you know, to better understand what is the role of pain in dementia. So what were the results, if you know, what did we sort of, you know, um, derive at, sort of, you know, by looking at them? In the first phase, sort of, you know, we came to this conclusion as part of, sort of you know, these deliberations that medical definitions of pain underestimate that pain is based on a two-way relationship. Uh, which in broader terms requires the need to listen and the ability to relate to the person. So therefore, you know, when we say a two-way relationship, it, it's just not, you know, dependent, right, what you can sense here on the person expressing themselves, but it's also really very much dependent on the other person who is involved in this. Are they actually able, you know, to listen or, you know, see in a sense the signaling that this other person is providing? Are they sort of, you know, do they have those, you know, observation skills and, you know, that competence themselves in order to relate to the state in which this person is in, in, in order to understand that? So that was sort of, you know, one element. And from there, sort of, you know, it was specified further, which then in turn meant that it was linked to this idea of building a relationship or connection at the human level. So when we say here at the human level, <clears throat> um, it was, it was, you know, common sense as we derived this in this experimental workshop to say that it means in order to understand pain, we cannot just look at the injury or we cannot just, you know, look at, um, you know, the, let's say, you know, uh, mental problem, but we really sort of, you know, need to understand the whole person in a sense of, you know, who they are, what are their preferences, uh, what's their history, what's their social environment, uh, what are they coming from? And really sort of only when we kind of, you know, consider this broader context of who they are, their identity, then we can actually, actually understand how they understand pain, what it means to them, how they construct it, how they feel about it, how they experience it. And that was something that was then further, in a sense, detailed and discussed in the, in the second phase, sort of, you know, when we then moved sort of, you know, to the smaller tables. And what we see here is that many of the comments refer to their role of pain in the interaction with persons with dementia and their carers. And for, instance, for example, in providing support or helping to interpret their pain, accepting their self elevation of pain. So what we actually see is we have quite a shift in a sense away from the person, let's say, you know, with dementia, but also, you know, being paying much more attention to those sort of, you know, around them who witness this particular state, right? Their carers, their informal carers, the people who are with them, the carers in the home, what is actually their ability? How are they sort of, you know, seeing pain themselves and understanding pain themselves? And sort of, you know, let's say if they are then in a situation where a professional is coming in to kind of, you know, understand it, are they then able also to explain to a third person the state and experience of that other person that they have been observing? So we see sort of, you know, the kind of complexity of these interactions, you know, is increased here. And then also, I think what was quite a striking outcome was that many of the comments rejected an easy, easy classification of pain. So describing it instead as a challenging or kind of undefined state beyond simply being an unpleasant emotion. So many sort of, you know, said pain is much more part of a larger process. It's something sort of, you know, that we can't really easily grasp. And in particular, sort of, you know, that notion, we can't really seem to grasp it. We don't really know what it is. That is really sort of, you know, what it meant for many people when they kind of, you know, struggled with pain or what kind of, you know, pain signals to them rather than saying, oh, you know, it's something that is uh, uh, purely negative or it's like, you know, clearly negative for all of us. 
So what does it mean, sort of, you know, what does it mean in terms of, you know, doing all that research and this kind of experiment? How, how can we now define pain? So what kind of conclusion can be derived um, in terms of, you know, the kind of more medical understandings? And I think, so, if, you know, we derived at the following understanding that the medical definition of pain sees it very much as a kind of bodily experience, which can be accessed more or less directly and, object and objectively by the affected person. So therefore, sort of, you know, in this understanding, it's very much viewed as an unmediated experience. However, in our research, you know, the present findings suggest that pain should instead be understood as a mediated experience because it depends jointly on our nervous system, our brain, how we feel about things and how we relate to others. So therefore, pain sort of, you know, is something that exists and acquires its meaning very much within this particular network. So based sort of, you know, on this component that pain is something that exists, if you know, within this network, and also, you know, based on what I said earlier on this kind of, it's being considered a broader process. We came up with the completely alternative definition of pain. It, it, you will see it's a bit of a complicated one, but I'm gonna explain it in a bit more detail. So it reads as follows, that pain can be defined as an interruption of the socially mediated process of bodily meaning making. So what do we mean sort of, you know, by the slightly complex definition? So let me give you an example. I mean, while we're all sitting here, sort of, you know, in this presentation, I'm pretty sure, sort of, you know, no one sort of, you know, at the moment knows or feels that they have an ear or that they have a nose, right? Or a certain sort of, you know, bodily part. All these sort of, you know, parts in a sense that we have and that are parts of, you know, or even sort of, you know, our mind and so forth. They're parts sort of, you know, of our everyday identity. They're kind of you know, invisible because they're incorporated in the sense of who we are, how we define ourselves, how we go on about our everyday life, what we can do, how we function, sort of, you know, how we are part of these relationships. But what happens with pain is, in a sense, is that self-understanding of you know, how a body sort of, you know, is incorporated in these interactions is suddenly interrupted. Suddenly, sort of, you know, we start to feel our ear that wasn't there before. And what does it mean sort of, you know, in terms of our self-identity? What does it mean in terms of how giving sort of, you know, meaning to this particular occurrence? Is it kind of challenging our understanding of, you know, who we are? Can we still go on with us, you know, our daily um, activities and so forth, right? So, and this is sort of, you know, why the experience of pain can be quite a challenging one because essentially sort of, you know, it is this kind of sense-making process which is being triggered here, right? You know, due to this, in a sense, unknown elements of, you know, in this kind of broader formula that we are so used to, you know, to do and do really well um, in our everyday life. So what is the consequence of this alternative definition? And I think there are a number of, you know, elements that you find in the literature, which I think um, this definition is much more capable to explain sort of, you know, than the more medical definitions. And I'd like to give you some examples what I think, so to show, you know, some of the advantages of this one. So one of the, you know, common phenomena that you see in particular with people with dementia, you know, but those who sort of, you know, also have like experienced chronic pain or, you know, pain sort of, you know, across a longer period is what we call pain catastrophizing. And pain catastrophizing means that in a sense sort of, you know, the actual, let's say, experience of pain. So let's say it might be related to an inju injury is sort of, you know, somehow strangely disconnected from, you know, the overall experience. So suddenly sort of, you know, this experience of pain is kind of taking over, right? So suddenly sort of, you know, your, your entire awareness, whenever sort of, you know, you start to think about the ways of, you know, you operate in your, in your daily life, you always start to think about pain. It's always kind of, you know, lurking there. You're almost afraid, you know, to do certain activities because you might think, suddenly the pain might come back there. So you're becoming also, you know, from a neurological perspective, much more sensible, sensible to the sensitive to this one. So, so, you know, even then like, you know, really minor injuries can sort of, you know, suddenly put you in a state where you think sort of, you know, you feel a very severe pain. And I think the idea with this, this behind this of, you know, pain catastrophizing is this, that this interruption, right? So if, you know, this sense-making process is still going on. You're, you're unable sort of, you know, your, your, your kind of your overall meaning making is unable to classify that, to, you know, put that into perspective, to give a certain meaning of this. So you're kind of, you know, always, you know, writhing on this constant sort of, you know, interruption that it's, you know, doesn't sort of, you know, fit sort of, you know, into this picture of your identity and who you are. And this is then sort of, you know, the kind of challenging part that sort of, you know, you don't really know what it is. And that's the kind of, you know, then 
lurking and presenting sort of, you know, that constant challenge in terms of, you know, your, your overall psychological state and then sort of, you know, having like a really severe sort of, you know, impact on those people's lives. I think what you can also see from this definition is, is I think we can better understand why there are actually, you know, quite a different variety and variations of pain awareness and also how people rate right and um so if you know, emphasize the pain experience and just to give an example from the workshop so when we discussed sort of you know that meaning making we actually had two gentlemen in the workshop and the way sort of you know they would define the meaning of pain in relation to them was actually quite similar so they defined pain very much so sort of, you know, as an experience of you know failure or sort of you know non-functioning of their body in sort of you know within their kind of um, uh, social background but the interpretation right, of that non-functioning was quite different because for one of them, it meant uh, the non-functioning would only be sort of, you know, a concern or a problem if he thought he would become um, um, a problem or like, you know, um, uh, dependent sort of, you know, uh, on other people, right? So, if, you know, that other people sort of, you know, would have to help him sort of, you know, support him. So if sort of, you know, that gentleman said, as long as I, you know, can get through the day and I'm sort of, you know, not creating a burden to be with others, I really don't mind the pain. So, if, you know, that is really not then a concern. It really only becomes a concern if I become a burden to others. And likewise, we had another gentleman who also you know, said exactly the same thing about the non-functioning, but here it was the other way around. And he said, so, if, you know, my interpretation is that if, sort of, you know, it becomes really like an important problem for me because a lot of people rely on me, I'm the sole, sort of, you know, generator of income in my family. So, therefore, sort of, you know, this non-functioning was something that was, really rated quite highly on his radar because a lot of, you know, depended on him functioning. So therefore, you know, when he had this experience of pain, it was really sort of, you know, something where he was extremely aware and what, you know, rated like, sort of, you know, quite severely in a sense of, you know, here's a major problem going on. So we can see sort of, you know, how this kind of meaning and how people relate to this is sort of, you know, part of their broader social environment and therefore leads to very different ratings in pain awareness. And then finally, so if, you know, I think what you might also see is here that this um, uh, considering sort of, you know, pain more in this kind of relational perspective, we actually also see that potentially it re relates quite nicely to what we call person-centered approaches to care. So, uh, so for those of you who might not know, so if you know what person-centered care is about, it doesn't necessarily mean personalized care in a sense, it is more individualized, but person-centered care means you really sort of, you know, try to take the social background of that person um, into account sort of, you know, when developing a treatment plan with them together. And I think that's sort of, you know, uh, broader sort of, you know, social assessments of, you know, also you know, incorporating their evaluation and their meaning sort of, you know, into this, I think could also be actually a really nice combination where potentially sort of, you know, that definition could also be linked up sort of, you know, with an approach, how sort of, you know, that um, understanding of pain could be, you know, developed further into a particular care practice. So why are we going from there? Um, so at the moment, I'm conducting a survey. So, you know, based on the research, as you've seen, there's a great emphasis, not just on the person experiencing pain, but, you know, that was also a bit of a you know, surprise for everybody involved, that element of the witnessing. So therefore, I'm doing at the moment a, sur um, a survey with a NHS trust in Lincolnshire, where we conduct a relatively large scale quantitative survey, trying to understand the definitions and understanding of pain in medical care stuff, and inform the carers so if you know how do how would they interpret this uh, what is their approach to this how do they observe this and so forth um, i'm also engaged um, in developing new tools kits and procedures so if you know kind of coming from a quite a digital perspective to identify means how we can you know monitor this kind of meaning making in pain you know be it through you know digital diaries or apps sort of you know different variety of tools and then also so if you know have a real interest in further development of the kind of accessible research methodologies that I mentioned. So for instance, you know, the one that we tried out on pain, I'm also sort of, you know, currently involved in a project in relation to um, cancer, where we again, sort of, you know, we are trying to work sort of, you know, within this particular context. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, what it is for me. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. And, you know, please do let me know if you've got any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian.